Hi everybody, we're going to start up again after the break. So for the next 45 minutes uh, or so, I'm going to uh, tell you about a new topic, which is ne <coughs> network analysis, and then we'll talk about enrichment map, um, which I'll tell you what that means. Um, and then we're going to have another lab um, for another 45 minutes where we get to uh, use what we've talked about in this lecture. Okay, so... Um, this topic is uh, about network visualization, and it's mainly here to introduce the next topic, which is a lot more relevant uh, for the material that we learned this morning. And we also um, provided some reading material in advance uh, so that we could go over this more quickly. Um, there's a lot of material online about learning network visualization and analysis and also how to use Cytoscape. So we chose in this class, in this workshop, to limit that and instead focus more on uh, labs and, and things like that. So, um, but we're happy to answer questions. So it is going to be a little bit quick, um, and but it, it will reference some of the reading material that hopefully everybody did. Um, okay, so um, in the beginning this morning, I talked about pathways and networks and how they're both representations of biological systems and pathways and processes in the cell. Um, and um, network analysis, networks, the idea of networks is a little bit more general than that. Um, we uh, assigned this uh, primer, uh, how to visually interpret biological data using networks, and we wrote it a number of years ago. Um, so hopefully everybody read that. That's kind of covers the basics of, of this topic. Um, and so I'll just provide a little bit of context and, uh, and additional information that will help us move to the next section. Okay, so networks represent relationships, um, and it's a, um, a general uh, type of data structure, I guess. Uh, you know, any kind of, you can imagine relationships, the idea of relationships is very generic. You can have relationships in lots of different fields, and you want to understand how they work. People study these a lot in social networks, for instance, how people are connected. And um, in biology, we tend to use networks for looking at molecular interaction networks or genetic interaction networks uh, re related to the cell. But you could imagine them being cell-cell interaction networks related to tissues, or people also use them for uh, food webs in ecology. So they actually have multiple applications, even in biology. Um, the ones that we'll talk about are more cell and gene-oriented. Um, and uh, so they, they tend to, re when we see them, they tend to represent re um, relationships like physical relationships, like a protein-protein interaction, a regulatory relationship like gene A regulates gene B, genetic interaction uh, where you have um, uh, like a, a epistatic relationship that you may have learned um, if you if you don't do model organism genetics, you don't come across these too frequently. But um, the idea is that you uh, like one mutation interacts with another mutation. So if you have a phenotype associated with mutation A and a phenotype associated with mutation B, and then you mutate both, you have a com uh, an organism that has two that has a combination of both mutations. If the phenotype is unexpected, given what you know about the A and B phenotypes, then that's a genetic interaction. It means something more is going on than than just uh, two independent types of mutations. Um, and then. Uh, functional interactions, you can imagine, are a little bit more generic. So actually all the three types that I mentioned are, you could say, functional interactions. We're going to learn about this more tomorrow, but the idea of a functional interaction is that genes are related. Um, if genes are related somehow functionally, you could draw a functional relationship between them. Like they have se similar sequence, or they have similar domains, or they have similar, they're part of the same pathway. All of those are examples of any kind of some kind of functional relationship, and that's useful for gene function prediction, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, but you also might find it uh, coming up in, in other contexts. Um, so networks are um, useful for discovering relationships in large data sets. If you just had a few relationships, you could draw them out. You could just write them like A connects to B and B connects to C. I you could understand that. But if you have thousands of these things. Um, and you put them in a spreadsheet and look at them, 
in tables, you can't really understand the global structure. So networks allow you to visualize the results and see global structure and how things are related to each other. Um, and the other advantage of networks is that they help visualize multiple different data types together. So for instance, we could view protein interaction networks and we can overlay gene expression data uh, on the network and see if there are certain patterns that, that are common. Um, and then finally, network analysis. Um, and so these are mostly covered in that uh, that pre-reading material. Um, what's not covered too much is network analysis. So uh, network analysis is a um, an analysis method that uses networks and uh, there are lots of different types. Just to get across the basic concept, I'm just going to cover this this um, this uh, idea of six degrees of separation. How many people have heard of this idea? Six degrees of separation. This is the idea that Everyone in the world is connected to each other by six steps uh, through a friendship network or acquaintance network. Um, so this idea originated in the 60s. This uh, social psychologist Stanley Milgram did an experiment where he asked people in Boston to send postcards to uh, somebody in New York. They had to do it through friends because they didn't have the person's address. So um, and each time a postcard went to a friend, uh, that they were instructed. The friend was instructed to send a postcard back to the uh, scientist uh, to um, to so that he could keep track of where things were going, and uh, quite a lot of the postcards actually made it to New York to this, these random people. And um, on average, it took six hops. Um, so that's where this idea comes from. It's probably a lot closer now with Facebook, um, but uh, you know, the, um, it, it's an interesting example that people have heard about sometimes, and um, sort of you can think about how it works and. Uh, the question, if you had a network mapped out, like the Facebook network, if you wanted to know if you're connected to someone else um, and how, then there's, that's a, you know, a, a simple question, like how am I connected to this other person um, and, and what is the, the path? Um, so there's a, um, a computer science algorithm uh, that is called Shortest Path by Breadth for Search. And it's from the field of graph theory. So in computer science, they don't call things networks; they call things graphs. Um, we don't use we use the term networks in biology because um, if you say graph, most people think plot, um, like x x versus y. So, um, but if you if you're interested in learning more about this topic, um, you search graph theory, and you'll find a lot of uh, like a hundred years of research in computer science in this topic, or and in math. Um, so this field has come up with all sorts of interesting algorithms, and they've proven that they work. So in this case, um, we can just say, if we're interested in figuring out the path from A to B, we can just go talk to a computer scientist, and they'll say, oh, use this shortest path algorithm that's been developed decades ago, um, and it will tell you if, they're, if two nodes are connected, um, and if so, it will find the shortest path. And if they're not connected, it will say, I can't find the shortest path. And it's interestingly guaranteed to do that mathematically they've proven it um, so you could the advantage of, of of understanding that analogy and mapping sort of the um, biological networks to graph theory is that there's a whole bunch of these algorithms that are available and they're uh, very powerful because they're many of them are proven to work in particular ways and you could just go to that library and take them and say I'm going to use this algorithm to answer this question um, and so obviously we could ask if two proteins are connected and um, and find out how they're connected. Is that biologically relevant? Maybe, maybe not. Um, it depends on our network. Um, just because proteins are connected in a network uh, by some path doesn't mean that path actually exists in the cell. Uh, the proteins have to be co-expressed, etc. So there's additional biological information that you need to think about, but it just illustrates the idea that you can use algorithms from computer science to solve problems, um, and ideally biological problems. So people have spent, um, I guess, since around 1999, 2000, so almost 20 years, um, trying to figure out different ways that they can uh, answer biological questions with computer, these computer science algorithms. And people have come up with all sorts of different interesting types of network analysis um, over this time. So for instance, gene function prediction, which we'll talk about tomorrow, um, detection of, of protein complexes and other modular structures. This is useful. Uh, if you have a network, uh, I don't think many people here are generating networks as part of their, their um, uh, data, uh, but if you were mapping protein interactions, 
you would be interested in looking for modular structure that could represent protein complexes. Um, this method is used in something we'll learn about tomorrow, um, uh, and so it might be mentioned. Um, you could study network evolution. You could predict uh, new relationships. So given existing relationships, predict new ones. Um, and that's useful for kind of completing the database. And then there's also uh, more disease-oriented, clinically relevant uh, types of um, network analysis methods, uh, like identification of networks that um, relate to disease. And this we'll also talk about tomorrow with the Reactome FI uh, Viz uh, Cytoscape app, um, where you can identify regions of a network where the genes are highly connected and also mutated in, in uh, if you're looking at cancer mutations, for instance. Um, people have tried to use network information to help diagnosis. So not just, you know, you, you've probably heard of the, air, the idea of biomarkers. So this is a pattern in your data that's predictive of some outcome, like can I find a gene expression biomarker that predicts whether someone's going to respond to a drug or not. Um, if you incorporate network information, sometimes you do better at those, those types of problems um, for the same reasons I mentioned this morning about why pathways are useful. Um, um, and then uh, um, this is uh, um, related to this mutation idea that, you know, which parts of the network are mutated. So just, these are just some examples. Um, and <coughs> These slides sort of uh, have some additional examples here that you can search, but um, in general, um, we're covering the major ones in this workshop, so we'll, we'll be talking about them. Okay, so that's a network. A network is, you know, these relationships, but what's missing? So a network is, um, you could ask the same question, I guess, about the gene sets and even the, path, the detailed pathway diagrams that you might know from textbooks. Um, the, uh, um, what these things are models of cellular processes and they don't capture everything that's going on in the cell. In fact, we don't know most of the things that's going, that are going on in the cell. Um, but we know for sure that they, they're, they're missing out on dynamics. Um, so they typically represent static processes. Um, it's difficult to represent like a calcium wave on a neuron or some feedback loop with these systems. Um, there are more detailed mathematical representations that can simulate processes, um, but people don't usually use them. Uh, ideally, we would use them. They would be quite useful for predicting, like, what happens if I knock out a gene or something. The problem is, is that they, um, they need such detailed information about rate constants and things like that, that it's impractical to use them because we just don't have that information measured on most, most proteins. Um, networks also don't uh, have a lot of detail. Usually a gene is represented as a node or a circle, and um, but we know that genes have structure and proteins have structure, uh, so that could be represented, but generally it's not. Um, and also context is missing. So for instance, um, it would be nice if I have, usually when I see a network in biology, it's the network for the cell, but it doesn't say it's the network for photoreceptors in the eye or cardiomyocytes those would probably be different networks. They would be different networks, and um, we can increasingly get information, cell-type networks, but most networks that we get are sort of union of all information um, across all, all stages of development and, and cell types. Um, okay, so that was a quick um, overview of uh, just a couple of additional points for networks um, that, uh, just to summarize um, here, and um, a couple of additional points um, is uh, are that um, when you see a network, you should understand right away what the nodes and edges mean. Sometimes they can mean different things. So a node could mean a protein in one case. In another case, it could mean a, sm a, mo a small molecule or a drug or something. And you, you don't want to mix those two things up. Um, relationships are even more important. Um, usually in biology, there's only a few types of nodes, but in there are many types of relationships, so physical protein interaction is very different than a, um, uh, a genetic interaction that I mentioned. Um, maybe a, a more uh, relevant example would be a relationship that says that two genes are co-expressed. Um, that doesn't mean they physically interact. It, it, you know, physical interaction is a lot more of a strong statement than for, for function prediction than genes happen to be co-expressed. Um, and because there's a lot of different methods available for uh, gene-listed network analysis, and I guess 
we, we're going to mention this a few times in this workshop. Um, uh, earlier, Veronique was uh, mentioning that you can go look at omics tools, and you know, there's certain websites that you can go and look to find tools. Um, there are hundreds of tools available for network analysis um, that I'll mention in a second, um, and sometimes it can be overwhelming. So, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, if you become an expert in the area, you can figure it all out. But if you, you most most people would be approaching this with a question like I have gene expression data and I want to uh, I want to do this um, and then you can um, uh, search for a solution either by going on a, a mailing list. So I'll talk about Cytoscape. Cytoscape has a good mailing list. You can email your question there and it gets answered by within a week um, and at most and uh, and so um, you know. Sometimes that's what you need to do is talk to people and communicate online in, in online forums. Um, okay, so the next topic is network visualization and analysis using Cytoscape. So um, uh, Cytoscape is a um, freely available, um, and again, I'm, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly um, because you guys in installed it and went through it uh, already. Um, I'm going to give a demo again just to quickly show you some, some features so everybody uh, um, knows the main features. Um, Cytoscape is a uh, freely available network visualization and analysis tool um, developed by a collaboration of a number of different people, um, including um, our lab is one of the labs. We have two full-time software developers that work on uh, developing Cytoscape, and there's uh, about 10 or 12 globally. Um, and um, it provides uh, basic functionality for visualizing networks, and then you can extend the uh, functionality by downloading apps. Um, so the basic functionality allows you to visualize and manipulate networks and query them and lay them out, and you can also do database searching. Um, the App Store is uh, present. This is an old picture, but there are actually, I think, th over 330 apps now. Um, and if you go to the App Store at apps.cytoscape.org, you can rank them by their popularity, for instance, and so you can see the ones that people are using. Those are probably the ones that are most useful, um, and you can read about them, um, but there are many others. So um, you can search here for, for things of, of interest and browse around the categories that are available. Um, so there, Cytoscape's not the only uh, network visualization tool. There are other free ones and some commercial ones. It's definitely the most popular and kind of one unique part about it, uh, I guess, is the apps, um, but also um, an active community of people. And these numbers like, are actually out of date. So there's, I think it's like 16,000 downloads a month or something now, and um, 5,000 people run it a day, uh, started up a day in the world. Um, so um, the advantage of that is that there are people on forums who have probably done something similar to you. And so if you go to the mailing lists um, or if you look at tutorials, you can find uh, a bunch of uh, information. The mailing lists you can, again, email and, um, and usually get an answer. Um, here's a picture of a Cytoscape um, meeting that we had a few years ago in Toronto and people spelled out Cytoscape just for fun. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to move to the Cytoscape demo. Uh, the main point of Cytoscape is it's a useful free software tool for network visualization and analysis. We're going to use it in the next lab and also tomorrow. Um, okay, so the latest version is Cytoscape 3.6.1, and um, and I don't know if this computer still um, is recording when I do this, um, but um, okay, so. What I did uh, before starting here is um, okay, I'm gonna make this bigger in a different way so you can see the menus. Um, so just to show how Cytoscape works, I am uh, I've loaded up some data. The data that I loaded up is a um, a sample file that comes with Cytoscape. So if you go to the Cytoscape directory, so on this computer, Cytoscape is, is in applications. You don't have to follow along now, but um, just you can just watch what I'm doing. Um, so, uh, there's a, in applications here, I've got a Cytoscape 
3.6.1 folder and in sample data there are some files here and one of them galfilter.cys uh, is a file that I loaded up that has uh, a bunch of information preloaded so it's useful for demos. Um, .cys is a Cytoscape session file. Um, if you've installed Cytoscape in it, it's, uh, you selected to um, uh, have your computer recognize those files. In the future, you can just double click those files and Cytoscape will load up. Um, and this gal filter happens to be a yeast protein interaction network. Um, so uh, You'll see here that uh, this network is sort of pre-laid out and the nodes have different sizes and colors. Um, the first thing I can do here is I can, I can move this network around, I can click on a node and I can move it around. Um, if I want to click multiple nodes, I press shift and I can, get, I can select a bunch of them and I can move them around. Um, and um, most of the time when you load up data, it might not be laid out very well. So the first thing you'll probably do is lay out uh, uh, um, your network. So in the layout menu, uh, there's lots of different types of net of layouts. So if I just do a grid layout, it's not going to look very good. Um, everything is just organized in a grid. It's a big mess. Um, this might happen if you load up a network that you've downloaded from somewhere and um, it doesn't have a layout associated with it. So I'm going to um, uh, Uh, apply this prefuse layout and that's one of the default layouts and and it um, lays it out very nicely and I think that the, the reading material that we talked about talks about uh, those layout um, algorithms but I can answer questions about it um, one of the common questions is what you know how does it figure out the length of the of the connection in this case most layout algorithms just choose to lay out the nodes such that they don't overlap and that they try to reduce the crossings in the number uh, the number of crossings that the edges um, have, and that clears things up and it, it makes it easy to sort of see the structure. Um, and the length of the edges is just, is just determined to optimize those two other things, so they don't have any meaning. Some of the layout algorithms they do try if you had some weight like a confidence value associated with your interactions, they could consider it and pull things together closer if they're um, if they are um, uh, um, more stronger, strongly connected. Um, I forgot to download the Y Files app here, which has some nice layouts. Um, if you haven't done that, I recommend doing it. Let's see if I can just quickly do it now. So this Y Files is Y F I L E S. Um, so I'm going to install that, and hopefully this works. Okay. So now that I've installed that, now under um, under layout, I now have a bunch of additional options. Um, so one that I like is Y Files Organic. Uh, so it, it it works pretty similarly to the other one, um, and uh, but it's 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 nice. And there's some additional layouts there. Um, one of the things you notice uh, you might notice if you side escape is that um, when you're using this, is that the labels are disappearing here. Um, the reason that is is that um, side escape tries to speed drawing of networks up. Um, and um, it can do that by getting rid of the labels uh, because if you have a big network with lots of labels, it slows it down a little bit to draw all of them. And if it, it zoomed out too far such that you couldn't even see the labels even if they were there, it just, it just hides them. So if you want to see everything, you can go to View and you can click Show Graphics Details here and then everything will always be there and it won't, it won't do any of that hiding. Um, so. It's, it's there, but you can see as you get smaller and smaller, you can't really read them. So, um, But sometimes it's useful if it, that effect is disconcerting. Okay, so um, uh, what you should do with layouts, if you're, um, in, if you're interested in learning about them, is just trying a bunch of them out. So um, you can often undo a layout if it's uh, um, not to your liking, but I would just go through this menu and try out a bunch of layouts and see what they look like because then you'll know what types of layouts exist. Like here is a um, hierarchical layout. Um, if I had a tree, this would be a better, like a, a tree network would be better to um, lay out with this type of network. Um, and let me try a um, circular layout. So this organizes everything in a circle. 
Um, sometimes that's useful, and if you have an attribute, you can order things in the circles, like most expressed to least expressed. Um, okay, so I'm just going to quickly go back to this one. Uh, yeah, so summary, I, I recommend trying out a bunch of different layouts just to learn what types of layouts there are, and then you'll, then you'll know. Um, another thing... Sorry, how do you zoom in and out? Uh, I'm zooming in and out with uh, the zoom, uh, two-finger zoom on the Mac. Um, you, can, you can use these buttons up here to zoom in and out as well. Um, usually different computers will have different shortcuts for how to zoom. Um, if you have a mouse, it's the scroll wheel. If you have a trackpad, frequently it's two-finger. Um, uh, well, it's, it, it's, um, it's a scroll wheel, so it's how you scroll uh, um, windows, like the, find, the Finder or Windows Explorer. However you scroll that up and down, it's the same for, for this. Um, and yeah, we have not um, set it such that the kind of pinch to zoom thing doesn't, doesn't work on this. Um, so it's scrolling. Um, okay, so um, a couple of other things I want to show you. Uh, one of the, the things that happens sometimes with networks is that they get too complicated. And so um, it's nice to be able to make a smaller network. So one of the things that you can do um, is, uh, well, find something here. If I type in MCM1, um, it highlights this, this node in the middle. Um, so that allows me to find something quickly. I can also filter uh, this network by um, some, some value. That happens, there happens to be a bunch of values loaded in the sample file, so I can filter these. In this case, I'm getting all the most highly connected nodes, um, and the slider bar here that I'm moving is changing that automatically. Um, and if, I, if I'm able to find some subset of the network, um, like say I, I zoomed in and I wanted to just look at these, these nodes here, um, then I can go to File, New, Network from Selected Nodes, All Edges, and it would make a, 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 another network that's just those guys. Um, and if I want to lay that out, it would look slightly different. Um, and now if I go back to the network panel up here, um, now I have two networks. I have my original network and this little child network, which is um, the smaller set. And this tells me how many nodes and edges there are, these numbers here. Um, and this, this is a collection of networks. Um, if I have lots of these, I can collapse them. And this says it has two, there's two networks in this collection. Um, the color of the nodes. That's what I'm going to go to next. So the uh, good question. So um, the other thing you can do is load up information, and the tutorials kind of tell you more about how to do this. But if I click on one of these nodes here, um, and I look at the bottom here, I can see that there's a bunch of information on this uh, about these nodes, like names um, and some other variables, including. Um, Some gene expression data at the end here. Um, if I click this little, this little uh, show columns, it will tell me all the columns that there are, and I can turn them on and off. Um, and um, by default, most of them are on. Um, and so, um, and you can do the same thing with edges. If I if I select an edge here, um, I have to click on the edge table at the bottom here. So nodes, node attributes, and edge attributes. So here are some edge attributes. Here are some node attributes. Um, if I select a bunch of nodes, then it will just show me those uh, those nodes here. Let me select just two. Um, so here, it just shows me two here at the bottom. So I can take these numbers and map them to visual properties um, with a style uh, panel. Um, again, there's tutorials on this, but for instance, I might want to... Um, some of these are already set in this sample file, so the fill color is um, set to map some gene expression data. Um, so I'm going to get it to map something else, um, another type of uh, gene expression data that's here. Oops. Okay, so I switched to another type of gene expression data. If I click on this, I can sort of change lots of options here. I can um, change the color to red, and now this is now mapping from blue to red. Um, so this, this little panel here is sort of a very powerful visualization system that can take data that you have, in this case, 
the um, the data is some expression values that range from minus 2.426 to positive 2.05, and there's a the zero line is is white. Um, so um, you can set these things up, and and it, you can visualize your data. So um, the other thing that's visualized here is the uh, the size. So the size is um, the degree, uh, which is the number of connections. So the, the more connections a node has, the bigger it is in this network. Um, I can change that so that um, I'm going to change this to be smaller, and now those bigger ones get smaller. So anyway, OK. Yep. Uh, the yellow is, um, I think, uh, if I look at the fill color, um, the yellow is stuff that's out of range. So this this little color here, if I click, um, you know, purplish, then those should change to purple. Um, this one's yellow because uh, I was select I had selected it, so it can be confusing. Um, any other questions about Cytoscape? Quickly. Okay, so. Um, Going back to the presentation, um, this presentation has some additional slides that are just sort of backups um, and uh, um, talk about the concepts that I mentioned. Um, and the um, they also have uh, there's also some information about um, at the end here about different apps that are available and. Um, there's one that does enrichment analysis, but we don't use it that much anymore because um, the current pipeline that we have is, is better. Um, this find active subnetworks is similar to something that we're going to teach tomorrow. Um, you, this is a way of clustering your, your network data. Uh, and there's some, a text mining app, although um, it's, it's, uh, um, it's actually one of the more popular apps. You can try it out. Um, you can type in... You can do PubMed searches, and it will try and get a, a network uh, result. And this was, uh, I was talking to someone earlier about text mining. This is an example, kind of older, so um, it's not very up to date. Um, and then these, these slides just uh, kind of go through some additional apps that you can look at if you're interested. And then also, there's some tips and tricks, which I, I covered some of them. Um, but it, it gives you a little bit of extra information. So I'm, I'm not going to go through these, but they're in your uh, slides for um, reference, basically, um, if you become a, an active Cytoscape user. OK, so I'm now going to move to another topic, um, which is enrichment maps. Um, OK, so this is going to be more uh, sort of get more interesting because it's it's covering it's sort of tying things together from from today um, so hopefully I can finish this in in about 15 minutes or so um, but the uh, um, so so this follows on from what we learned about this morning and up to the GSC and G profiler lab that um, enrichment analysis is extremely useful um, and frequently you get these big long lists of pathways um, so it's great. You know, thousands of papers, as I mentioned this morning, almost every genomics paper does something like this type of analysis. Um, but one of the problems that we have here is that um, there's a lot of uh, similar pathways that, that are spread out all over this list. And so if you want to, if you get a lot of pathways, um, sometimes it's, it's hard to sort of quickly see the major themes. So for instance, there's um, a bunch of pathways like adaptive immune response and um, uh, regulation of inflammatory process and my, uh, um, myeloid lymphocyte mediated immunity. So if you know a lot about biology, you can re realize that those are all related to immune response and inflammation. Um, but otherwise, you'd have to kind of search all over the place. So um, a number of years ago, um, we developed uh, a method of visualization, visualizing these results called enrichment map. Um, so basically, it takes the data like this, and it shows it to you as a network. So now you know why I introduced Cytoscape just now, because we actually use Cytoscape network visualization technology to visualize these results. So, um, so the idea is that you have a bunch of gene sets, like pathways, and 
Um, each pathway gets visualized as a, as a node, um, and um, the size of the node is proportional to the number of genes in the set, and the color of the node is proportional to the enrichment map score, like the enrichment score, sorry, enrichment, enrichment score, um, like the normalized enrichment score or any other score that you can get from enrichment, uh, pathway enrichment analysis tools. Um, and then the gene sets are connected if they, if they share genes, if there's genes that are shared between the gene sets. So frequently you'll have gene sets or pathways that um, come from different databases, but they're basically the same. Like five databases will have the Wnt pathway. And so um, Enrichment Map will uh, identify that they all have, that they have a lot of genes in common. And then when you run a layout in Cytoscape, it will group all of the things that are similar based on the edges that, that connect them, the, the, um, the, the lines, the green lines. Um, the thickness of the green lines is proportional to the number of genes that are shared. Um, okay, so, um, uh, so we can take the GSEA example that we learned about, and GSEA gives us a bunch of pathways that are enriched in condition A versus B, and also condition B versus A, so frequently we think about this as upregulated and downregulated. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that the pathway is actually activated. It, it means that the pathway is enriched in the upregulated genes, which could be negative regulators of the pathway. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then <coughs> for GSEA, we can take the significance and we can we can color the nodes. But this time, because we have up and down, we can color them uh, two different colors, red and blue here. Um, and the overlap uh, between these is computed as there's a couple of different ways of doing it, but it's basically a set overlap statistic. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll show you some examples of, it, of this in, in use so you can see how it works. So this is uh, some data that we analyzed. Uh, this data was published in 2007, and we found it in the database and used it in the enrichment map paper. Um, it's a, a simple analysis. We chose it because it's a simple analysis and it was pretty clean because it used uh, cell lines, um, and uh, those are typically more, uh, less variable, have less variation than patient samples, for instance. So um, in this experiment, breast cancer cells were treated with estrogen or not. And they were looking at how this response changed over time. Um, so let's just focus on one time point after a day of treatment, uh, 24 hours. Um, so they did three uh, biological replicates of treated versus untreated, um, do all the standard processing, get your differentially expressed genes, run it through GSEA as we learned uh, this morning, get your results, and then you can load it in enrichment map, and you'll get something that looks like this. It doesn't look exactly like this. This is a publication version of it, but we'll um, get to that in a second. Um, but you can see immediately that um, there are major themes that pop out, um, translation, protein sorting, RNA transport that are going up, and these ones are going down. So this visualization allows you to, at a glance, sort of quickly see what major themes are going up and down. And if you zoom in on one of these, you can see, um, we're zooming in on this one, you can see these, these nodes have different pathway names, microtub microtubule organizing center, centrosome, um, and these are all related um, as a sort of set of skeleton theme. Okay, so that's a fairly simple idea. Um, the, it's, it's not that complicated, it's really just a visualization method. It's meant to just help you interpret the results of uh, something like GSEA. You don't have to use this method. The GSEA provides nice reports and if you're happy with that, you can uh, use that. Um, you, you usually don't need this method if you only have a few pathways that come through. This method tends to be more useful if you have dozens or hundreds of pathways and then it's, it's useful to identify these themes uh, in an automated way. Um, the other thing you can do with this that is not easy to do with uh, standard enrichment analysis is do comparisons of multiple conditions. Um, so here we're, we have two time points, 12 hours and 24 hours, um, and um, uh, we have new features in enrichment app now that make this better. I should have updated these slides to, to show the pie charts and the things we can do now. But, um, just to, to illustrate um, what we did here was we uh, did the same type of enrichment analysis at 12 hours and 24 hours, and we um, mapped the enrichment results, the enrichment statistics from the early time point to the middle of the nodes and the late time point to the border of the nodes. And then um, you can see that a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, pathways are enriched in the up, 
you know, the uh, upregulated genes at both time points. But some of them, like these ones here, for instance, ubiquitin-dependent protein degradation, are not enriched at the early time point and very enriched at the late time point. So that's something that's different between the two time points. Here's another example of something that's different. It's uh, part of DNA metabolism. Um, and, you know, so at, again, at a glance, you can see, answer the question, what's different between the pathways that are enriched at the early versus the late time point. And now in enrichment map, you can, you can do, we used to have a limit of just two, uh, but now you can do more than two. In enrichment map, if you load up your gene expression data, if you have gene expression data or some other kind of data that you can load up as values of, of, of information like gene expression data, then when you click on a node, you can see the expression values. And so here you can see that um, uh, the protein uh, degradation theme, one of these pathways uh, on the y-axis is all the genes. They're not labeled here, um, but they are in the app. Uh, and then across uh, the x-axis uh, are the different samples. And these are labeled here. So these are the early samples and the late samples. You don't get a visual. This was a manually created visualization, but there is a way of, of knowing what the, what the samples are. Um, so you can see that uh, at the early time point, there's not much difference between the treated and untreated. Um, they're both, uh, all the genes are up in both cases. But at the late time point, all of a sudden, treated, these genes go down. And so that's what causes this to get a strong signal. Um, and so you can, you can start seeing how you can use this tool to, once you find a pathway of interest, to, to start zooming in and explain the data a little bit more. So now we know that estrogen treatment at late time point lowers these genes and, um, you know, it's actually not lowering all the genes in this pathway, but there's a big signal of these ones going down and these ones staying up in the untreated. Um, there's more that you can do with this tool. Uh, um, one other uh, type of analysis is um, sort of the last major type of analysis is something we call query set analysis. It's a type of post analysis. So once you've div once you've created an enrichment map based on your GSEA results uh, or G profiler results, um, you can um, add in additional gene sets. Uh, those gene sets can be whatever you want, but it it might make sense to if you know a bunch of genes that are associated with the phenotype that you're studying, like a disease, you could add those as a gene set. And uh, which, you know, which pathways those genes are part of. So this little triangle here represents a gene set, and you can, it automatically draws lines between all the other gene sets that have some of those genes in common. And so in this analysis, this was a, a mouse uh, gene expression experiment that we found in the literature that um, had knocked out uh, a microRNA. So um, if you knock out a microRNA, you expect certain pathways might go up because the negative regulator is removed. So a lot of pathways go up, um, and a couple of pathways go down. And then we took the known targets of those, or the predicted targets of that microRNA, and uh, represented that as a set here, this little triangle. And then you can see that um, there's a bunch of pathways, especially in the up pathways, that have a lot of targets of that microRNA. So this might indicate that maybe this microRNA is regulating these pathways directly. Uh, this pathway doesn't have any microRNA targets, so maybe it's an indirect um, upregulation of this pathway. And the downregulated pathways don't have any targets, which is what we expect. Um, another example of this is, is using uh, uh, doing the same thing with transcription factors. So in this analysis, we did, this was a leukemia project, and um, we did a, uh, we had transcriptomics data, we made an enrichment map, uh, we did an enrichment analysis and an, and, and an enrichment map, and we um, had a bunch of pathways that came up. We also did some analysis of transcription factors that could explain the analysis, uh, the, the, tr the transcriptomics da data. And this is using a tool co called a possum. Um, we're not covering this on day three. I think we use iRegulon, which can help you um, in similar ways. Um, but the, uh, the top transcription factor that was predicted to be important is HIF1 alpha here. And so again, we we found HIF1 alpha targets that are um, predicted or known, and we represented, represented that as a, as a little triangle, and then um, we added it in, in Richard Map, puts it as a triangle, and then this shows all the pathways that those targets are part of. So again, it's not all the pathways, so it gives you a little bit more specific information about what might be happening in the sample. So we might think HIF1 alpha, if it's an important transcription factor, it's regulating these three you know, major pathway themes 
as the major thing that it would do. That's our hypothesis. Um, and that's what was used to develop this autism spectrum disorder uh, visualization that I mentioned in the morning, uh, this morning. Um, that was done with just um, gene ontology and a few pathway databases and actually domains, um, just to give you a little bit of uh, additional information. Um, Enrichment Map is a software tool that's an app for Cytoscape. So when you load it up, um, you can you can you know this is the we have a slightly we have an updated version now that looks slightly different different. Um, it's much easier to use, but the, you get the picture that you can um, do the things that I mentioned in here. Um, and the way we use this is um, we uh, start by visualizing all the pathways. And that gives us an overview of the whole, all the genomics data that we've that we've applied enrichment analysis to, and then we identify interesting pathways, and you can zoom in on those. Um, one of the things you could do you could do is if you pick out a specific pathway, you can take the gene expression data and map it to a network diagram of protein interactions or a pathway diagram, and overlay the gene expression data on that um, that diagram. Um, the tool we recommend using for that is PathVisio. Um, we can also use Cytoscape. Um, we haven't built that into the workflow in a uh, very streamlined way, so uh, something that we're still working on. Um, but um, it's something that you can do and uh, is sort of um, one way of drilling down to eventually get to the level of genes or proteins and protein expression or gene expression visualized on those genes and, and some to look for patterns. Um, we also uh, have um, word cloud um, and um, I, I should have included a slide call, uh, for auto annotate. There are two additional apps, um, Cytoscape apps that help um, visualize enrichment maps. So in enrichment map what you get is a uh, a network like this, and you can browse around it inside Escape. Um, these networks have nice bubbles around them with names. Um, we used to have to do that manually, but now we have a tool called Auto Annotate. So it's an, an app that you can download that um, that automatically draws bubbles around these themes and gives them names using a um, uh, sort of the most frequent words. Um, and uh, I just wanted to show this last picture for fun. Uh, Ruth developed Enrichment Map, uh, uh, the first version of it, and um, so she wrote all the software for, for that. And she, when she was presenting in a lab meeting, she made a Enrichment Map cookie, uh, which was awesome. Um, so I put, I'm, I'm not embarrassing her. Usually she's not here when I present this, but anyway. So it was, it was, uh, it was good because we realized that Enrichment Maps were useful and also uh, delicious. Um, okay, so uh, that was just a joke. Um, so that is it for um, this presentation. Um, the lab is now on, and what we want to do in the lab is try to run Enrichment Map. Um, and so for that, you'll have to, Veronique is, is going to, um, are you going to say anything about introducing where the lab is? Where, where is it on this? Okay, but I didn't set that up here, but... Um, okay, so in module three here, um, the lab practical part one, right? Yes. Okay, so um, so this creates an enrichment map from GSEA, and part two does the same thing for G profiler. That's it. Okay, so um, okay, so for this for this lab, you'll have to run Cytoscape. Um, hopefully it works on everybody's computers and, um, and then you can follow the lab and we have about 40 minutes, 40-45 minutes, uh, say 40 minutes, is that that's, gets us to five and so hopefully we can get through most of the lab um, quickly.